All right, hello, Chitra. Um, I'm going to introduce you now, <laughs> and I'm really excited to have the pleasure to do so. So, Chitra Ramaswamy is a journalist and author. Her first, her first book, Expecting the Inner Life of Pregnancy, was published by Sarah Band in April 2016 and won the Cell Tower First Book of the Year Award and was shortlisted for the Polari Prize. She has contributed essays to Antlers of Water, Nasty Woman, The Freedom Papers, The Bible, and Message from the Skies. She writes mainly for The Guardian, is the restaurant critic for The Times, the Scottish edition, a columnist for the National Trust for Scotland, and broadcasts regularly for BBC Radio Scotland. She lives in Edinburgh with her partner, two young children, and rescue dog, and is currently working on her second book, which hopefully she'll tell us a little bit about. All right, amazing. Thank you, Tritra, so much for joining us. Um, I was just talking about how much I love your essay in Atlas of Water, and I'm really excited to hear you um, speak with us and read for us today. Thank you so much. It's absolutely lovely to be here. Um, so I hope everyone uh, can see me okay. And uh, I just want to start by saying thank you so much for asking me to give the keynote uh, today. I super appreciate it. It's just uh, it's just such a, a lovely thing to do. Um, at the end of an extremely difficult uh, and turbulent week, uh, yet another one. So I'm just going to start by, uh, I'll talk for a few minutes and then I will finish with a reading. Um, and what I want to really talk about today is, uh, is voice. And it's something that's really been preoccupying me, I think, as a, as a writer in recent years. And, um, and I think it's been a preoccupation of the culture as well. And when I say voice, I think I both mean the kind of the emergence of the writer's voice, um, how this kind of happens, uh, this sort of weird, magical, frustrating, elusive process. Um, and it takes a lifetime. I've kind of noticed it almost happens in tandem with living, kind of the, the living and the writing um, and, and the emergence of the voice are all just so kind of uh, intertwined. Um, the benefit of this is uh, as you become a better writer, um, you kind of become a happier person at the same time. Total bonus. Um, so yeah, so voice, the emergence of the writer's voice. And then critically for me, it's been about a kind of granting permission to myself to, to write in that voice. Um, and what do I mean by permission? I really don't mean um, gaining the permission from someone else. So this kind of, the, the publishing industry, this kind of, this, this big thing that we're constantly trying to, to access and understand and, 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 and show ourselves to and show up for. Um, I'm really talking about the permission that only we can grant ourselves. Um, so the kind of capacity to find our voice and then somehow to give ourselves permission to write in it. And the reason I'm so preoccupied with this at the moment is because I've been working on my second book. Um, I've been writing it for two years now and I have never spoken about it in public before. So this is a first for me. Um, so it's, a, it's very new territory for me to be talking about this book. Um, and it's gonna be published by Canon Gate. So I, I've never said that in public either. And that's a, that's a massive thing for me. And I'm just so excited. Um, and basically it's a, it's a very strange hybrid book. Um, it's a kind of combination of memoir and biography. So I'm kind of thinking of it as this sort of mashup of kind of memoirography. Um, and what do I mean when I say that? I mean that I'm both simultaneously trying to tell somebody else's story and kind of locate myself within it at the same time. Who is this person? Um, he's a great friend of mine, a man called Henry Wuger, and he is a 96 year old German Jewish refugee and Holocaust survivor. And he came to Britain in May of 1939 on the Kinder Transport. And I'm sure many of you will know what the Kinder Transport is, but basically it was a rescue effort that kind of happened right up at the 11th hour um, in the run up to the Second World War, where the British government agreed at the last minute to take really a very small number of unaccompanied refugee children from Nazi occupied territories. 
And in the end, a kind of uh, almost 10,000 children came to Britain and lived with foster families for what they thought was going to be a very short period of time. But of course, you know, they could not have foreseen um, the horror of the Holocaust and the length of the Second World War and the, the levels of devastation. And the vast majority of those children did not go back and lost their families. Their families were murdered in the Holocaust. So how did I meet Henry and Ingrid? Um, I met them in the summer of 2011 and I was working as a journalist um, at the Scotsman and I was sent basically to interview this couple in the run up to Refugee Week. And I had interviewed lots of people. I'd been a journalist for a, almost 10 years by that point. Um, and I went to their house in Gifnock with a photographer and I sat down with this extraordinary couple who were then in their 80s and, you know, had the great privilege, as journalists do, of them telling me their story, which they had shared a lot, but never, you know, uh, had sat down and had a long interview with a, with a national newspaper before. And um, I just was absolutely blown away by them. They were just the most kind of dignified and warm and generous and loving and kind people I had ever met and they they seem to have responded to this just unconscionable uh, tragedy genocide um, by you know responding with a kind of love of, of humanity it was just absolutely bewitching and intoxicating and I just wanted desperately to be their friend and so we became friends. And then over the course of the next decade, um, this decade running up to now, um, I've interviewed them sporadically over the years. So I think finally what happened when I came to write my second book, um, I'd written Expecting and you know, having a think about what I might do next. And I decided, you know, the cultural moment that we're living in, I wanted to write something. <clears throat> I just wanted to write something about belonging. I didn't really know anything more than that. It was such vast territory. Um, and I came up with this pitch. I thought I'm gonna write a, a series of, of immigrant stories. Um, my own might even be included, but I'm gonna travel around Scotland and it'll be a kind of hybrid form of nature writing and travel writing, but I'll go, you know, I'll go to the Isle of Butte and I'll meet a refugee um, and I'll tell their story from, you know, a refugee from, from Syria, or I'll go to Glasgow and I'll speak to, you know, um, an Italian immigrants who, who came here, you know, after the, after the war. And, and, and I thought Henry and Ingrid will maybe form one chapter of this book. And that's where the stuff about permission and voice started to come in, because I realised slowly that it was almost a way of not quite committing to what I really wanted to do, which was I wanted to spend an entire book on this one man who has come to me, mean so much to me. And I wanted to tell his story. Um, now, I don't think I've ever felt so nervous about doing anything. And I don't think I've ever felt so um, unprepared, actually. Um, this book kind of has come at a time in my life where, you know, am I ready to write this book? Um, I had so many good reasons to feel that I wasn't the right person for this book. You know, I'm not Jewish. Um, I've got no historical connection with the Holocaust. Uh, I'm not, I don't speak Hebrew. I'm not a historian. Um, I have been to Germany, um, but you know, as like a kind of, you know, a love of hipsterism in Berlin and going to like art galleries and things. What right, in other words, do I really have to tell Henry Wuger's story? And then I think something that's happened really slowly to me, which I, I hope will really speak to everyone who is uh, watching right now, is just a kind of coming to terms with my perspective on the world and a kind of understanding that actually being a person who occupies lots of marginal territories and has a kind of view from nowhere, which really is a view from everywhere, is a kind of superpower when it comes to telling other people's stories. I actually think it's taken me until my late thirties to really understand this and to have the confidence to really, really understand what my voice is, where it comes from, and, you know, to not just 
maybe feel marginalized by it as I probably did for the first three decades of my life, but to suddenly understand what it kind of, what it gifts me um, and what it gifts me. I always go back to, you know, we've all got our, um, we've all got our, our people, haven't we? Our prophets who we, who we turn to. And, you know, if I'm ever feeling really destabilized, you know, I pick up a, I, I, I prescribe myself a little bit as A.D. Smith or, you know, we, there's certain things that we do. I, I always think of Ang Lee, um, who I had the great privilege of interviewing uh, years ago. And, um, and we spoke a lot about this um, and, and the fact that he, you know, he came along and he made Sense and Sensibility. And then he went and made um, Brokeback Mountain. And, and in so doing these things, you know, there's a kind of sense of what it really means to be on the outside looking in and the very kind of special um, outlook it gifts you um, once you can kind of find a way to occupy um, that gaze. And I think every one of us, uh, everyone who's watching now, um, we know what it is to be seen as other. We know what it is to be sidelined, to be marginalized, to be spoken for rather than to, to be misunderstood. And I think we know what it's like to have to work harder, um, to have to sort of swim against the mainstream currents. And and, you know, those currents as well, we learn from a very early age, don't we, um, that we're not supposed to speak to them, uh, speak about them, that they have to remain invisible. So there's a kind of inarticulacy about this as well, which I think makes the voice, the voice that's kind of in there, all the harder to kind of locate and then, you know, um, possess. Um, but the flip side of all of that, of the kind of the, the outsiderness, is you get this kind of multiplicity and generosity of vision. Um, you know, we, we belong to lots of places. We, we straddle lots of cultures. We get to eat really, really good food. Um, and, and we get to kind of um, think with a certain multiplicity. And for me personally as well, it's really, it's meant that my kind of my sensitivity and, and my bullshit radar has, has become more and more finely tuned over the years. So the more we do it, the more we um, occupy this space, I think the kind of richer and stronger and more resonant our voices become. Um, so before I do my reading now, I just wanna finish with just a, a series of kind of permissions that have taken place for me. Um, while writing this book and um, I'm going to deliver it at the end of this year so in some ways I've been writing it actively for two years and, and it's been gestating for 10 it's been you know a massive project um, and I still don't feel settled about being the person who's telling the story and actually that's become the very point of it that kind of dislocation and uncertainty has become the place out of which the words are sprung and the fact is that Henry has gifted this, this story to me and we've become friends and he has given me permission to write it and he has opened up his archive and his story and his heart to me. The fact is me and Henry have got a shared history and we've got a shared perspective that comes from our outsider statuses. So I may not be the right person to write Henry's biography, but I'm the right person to write my version of it. The fact is in my heart, as a reader more than a writer, I really do believe that anyone can write anything if it's for the right reasons, if they're doing it with integrity and if they really know their stuff. And the fact is it's the systems, the structural changes that need to happen so that we don't continue to have one privileged mono voice telling all of the world's stories. And the fact is there's a moral imperative for me right now Henry's amongst the last generation of survivors. He's 96. His wife, Ingrid, very recently just passed away last month and she was a kinder transportee as well. The world is forgetting and so the time is now. I think there's a real kind of, that, that moral urgency, that sense of, you know, do the thing that you need to do when you have to do it um, is, you know, it's, it's when writing's at its most sort of frightening, but often it's where the, the best stuff is as well. Um, so I'd like to finish with an essay. Um, and I wrote this essay in 2018, um, which is exactly when I started to think, 
I think I'm going to write this book. Um, and I think I'm just going to have to try and kind of generate the, the faith and the, conf the confidence to just go for it. And it was for the Freedom Papers and it was published by Gutter Press. And the commission was about as wide as it gets. And it was to write an essay about freedom. And my essay is called A Voice of One's Own. Now I just have to find it. There it is. And I open with a quote by Virginia Woolf. So I'll start with a Virginia Woolf quote. Lock up your libraries if you like, but there is no gate, no lock, no bolt that you can set upon the freedom of my mind. And this is the essay. I once interviewed a woman, a famous glamorous novelist about to go stratospheric in the private lounge of a five-star hotel in London. There amongst the plumped up cushions on point and the inconspicuously refilled glasses of water, we talked about the things that writers of color tend to talk about out of choice, but also expectation. The subjects on which we're presumed to be expert and must strive to be if we are to succeed, race, colonialism, skin, also hair, identity, our so-called communities, escape, return, foreignness, and of course, stories. Our own and the ones we choose or rather are free to tell. We ended up discussing a secret from our childhoods, the kind that's first kept because you can't yourself see it. Continents apart, this woman and I had both started out writing about white people. We did not write with our own voices about our own experiences. We did not know that we could. So in the 80s, in the university town of Ensuka in southeast Nigeria, a bookish little black girl wrote Enid Blyton-esque stories about blue-eyed white children guzzling ginger beer. This despite the fact that she was black, Nigerian, and as you've, as you've probably guessed by now, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and she had never tasted ginger beer. At precisely the same time, on the other side of the equator, a bookish little brown girl lay on her back in the Royal London Park, where kings once hunted deer and dreamed of empire, and wrote Anne of Green Gables-esque stories about white orphans with red hair and green eyes. This was as close to seeing herself in books, to freedom, you might say, as her imagination could allow. Then what? She went home to her South Indian parents who had immigrated from Bangalore to leafy white Richmond upon Thames with its glitzy riverside development, glut of blue plaques and exalted hilltop views painted by Turner and overlooked by Mick Jagger. To the stainless steel cups and plates from a strange place called home in the kitchen cupboards. To the sour shame of lime pickle sandwiches in her school lunchbox. Toni Morrison wrote that imagining is not merely looking or looking at, it's becoming. Living and writing, inhabiting the words we produce that have in turn produced us cannot be prized apart. The circuitous business of finding one's voice is intimately bound up with the pursuit of becoming oneself. Both take a lifetime, both require personal and political freedom, but also, as Morrison writes, being mindful of the places where imagination sabotages itself, locks its own gates, pollutes its vision. So becoming less shackled to notions of what I should be happened in tandem with becoming a writer, or at least a better one. Also, bonus, a happier person. As the gates of my imagination opened, the words started to flow the painstaking solitary and mysterious act of committing words to pages and reading the carefully chosen words of others freed my voice and continue to free me. This, I think, is why writers are often outsiders. Our words are where we can be most at home. And this is why we need to know that there is a place for us in books. The simple, heartbreaking words that Adichie summoned in her TED talk titled The Danger of a Single Story haunt me because they voice my own unspoken experience as a child. I did not know that people like me could exist in literature. The Anne of Green Gables years passed. I found The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, or rather, I like to think it found me, then Zora Neale Hurston, and then Aaron Dutty Roy's The God of Small Things came out. The gates swung open, but perhaps they swung too far. I started trying to write Indian stories, the authentic kind I imagined posh white publishers snapping up. 
in which misunderstood brown women in silk saris spun chapati dough and yearned for the motherland. I felt like an immigrant in my own story. I did not speak Kannada, my parents' language. language. I know neither how asapetida smells nor how to spell it. And when we strung up fairy lights to celebrate Diwali in school, I was winging it as much as the next person. Meanwhile, at home, while my parents watched Mahabharata on the BBC, as they seemed to do for most of the early 90s, I listened to Madonna and David Bowie, smoked Marlboro Lights, and wrote a journal spiked with self-loathing and my own shameful yearnings to be white, blonde, smaller nosed, less hairy, anything but this. There seemed to be no space, no words, and certainly no market for this. My crisis of self made for both bad faith and bad copy. By the time I sat opposite a superstar black writer whose own hard won words were about to be sampled by Beyonce, so much more had happened. Our family home had been repossessed and we no longer surveyed the world from the heady heights of Richmond Hill, an outlook so representative of a certain kind of Englishness. It's the only view in the country to be protected by an act of parliament. I'd moved north, upping the ante on my outsider status by becoming an English person in Scotland on top of everything else. I'd fallen in love with a woman. I'd become a journalist and was trying as I've always been trying to write. But this time the words were coming. A strange, unclassifiable memoir, as well as a baby was gestating in my brown body, a voice and a life. A lifetime of self-censorship that people of colour have to live, which Renier de Lodge named so powerfully in why I'm, talking, why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, was slowly lifting. And it continues to lift every time I sit down to read or write. Every time I remind myself, and I have to remind myself, that I am who I am. That my experience is valid because it's mine. That my voice can be heard because I have one that there is always more than one version of a story, that there are, in fact, words for this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're just, oh, perfect. We're just unpinning you as a spotlight. Thank you so much, Chitra. That was an incredible reading. I loved the Freedom Papers when I first read them when Gutter published them. So that's, it was amazing to hear you actually read it. And it was wonderful to hear about your novel or your work in progress. Um, because you said it was the first time you've really talked about it publicly. So I feel like this has become quite a special space in that way. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. Well, thank you. And it's always nerve wracking the first time you talk about a new project, especially when, you know, I haven't completely finished it or, or, um you know delivered it I haven't delivered the manuscript yet um but you know it just felt really right um to be talking about it first to you lot thank you so much for for sharing that um congratulations as well um thank and you with Canon Gate, which is really exciting and I'm sure all of us especially after hearing you read that brilliant essay are gonna buy it as soon as it's out um <laughs> well I think it's going to be a while yet but no thank you I just yeah I couldn't have hoped to be in a better place than Canon Gate yeah so it's very exciting really, yeah lovely um just before we close out because we do mm -hmm. have a workshop starting in a couple of minutes I wanted to ask um if uh you wanted to plug any other events that you might be doing or um all your your twitter channels or social media or anything that you want people to keep an eye out other than your book which is coming Oh, you're talking to just the absolute worst self-promoter <laughs> in the world. Um, at Chit Girl is my Twitter, but I mean, I don't even tweet that much. Um, Chit Girl with two R's for Chit Girl, as in Riot Girl. Um, yeah, I I have been doing some events, um, mostly for Antlers of Water, actually, which is, you know, a, another Canning Gate um, book. Um, edit, a book of, uh, of nature and environment essays um, edited by Kathleen Jamie. Um, so that I've already done that though. So I haven't really, I, you know, this has been the other thing about this year has just been so, um, just so difficult in so many ways, but so difficult at the level of trying to write because um, I've got two young children who obviously were at home for huge swathes of the year. And um, so, I just have really not been taking much work um, 
I, I said, I'm saying I've really learned the art of saying no this year until it came to you lot. <laughs> <laughs> then I said yes <laughs> so this has been a very rare thing that I've done because I've had to just use up every single second of time that I've you know I am now a person who gets up in the dark to write um before anyone wakes up because that's the only time I can do it but yeah well we're we really appreciate you saying yes to do this and I think a lot of us should also take your advice on the art of saying no. I think that's a, that's a really good skill to eventually hone as artists and practitioners, especially in, I think, this digital era where we kind of are being asked to do quite a lot um, now that people can reach us more easily, um, possibly, I guess, in some ways. So yes, thank you very much. And so um, those, yeah, and those events that you were mentioning, I know a lot of them were recorded, like the Edinburgh Book, International Book Festival event. So even if nothing is coming up right on the horizon, um, please check out like the YouTube videos. Um, everybody in the uh, in the event right now, you can find Chitra speaking about Antlers of Water and doing other readings as well at that time. So, mm -hmm. And uh, the only other thing I think I've got coming up is I um, am going to be writing something for the Guardian about lockdown, um, mm -hmm. which will um, kind of show up later maybe later this year or even at the start of the next um so yeah I mean it's uh it's been such a extraordinary year it's been so hard to kind of be writing about it at the same time as as living it um but uh in some ways you know for those of us who do this who this is what we do mm -hmm. you have to somehow find a way to to pick up the pen or you know to to um open the laptop and and bring up a new page and start writing because you know there's got to be we've all got to find ways to to make a contribution amazing yeah absolutely um Thank you. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Um, and I think today we'll, and this keynote will have been really inspiring for us to pick up those pens and write as well. So thank you so much, Chitra. We'll be following you, you on you. Twitter. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And we're going to close out this session so that the workshop can get started in a couple of minutes. But thank you for having me. Bye. Take thank care. You. And I hope the conference goes really well. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye. Bye.